This is my AMD FX6300 that I recently dug out of storage so I could check it out again and relive some nostalgia. I have some big plans for this chip involving a 990FX motherboard and some really proper tuning, but for now I'm running a cheapo board with a completely stock so I thought it would be interesting to grab some baseline numbers by testing it out in a demanding suite of games. Upon their release in late 2012, these CPUs were well known to struggle against their Ivy Bridge competition, but well, how do they do today? Surely they couldn't have gotten any more appealing, right? Well, back when FX was released, quad-core CPUs were easily the most popular choice amongst gamers, but in an age where consumer CPUs regularly ship with 6, 8, 10, 12, and even 16 or more cores, newer applications and games have become a lot more parallel and make use of way more threads. So the real question is, have AMD's many-threaded FX CPUs seen any benefit from this drastic paradigm shift? Well, in this video, I hope to answer that and see if this mid-range offering from FX's final pile driver lineup still has it. I'm not going to delve into much specs and history of the FX6300 in this video, so we'll jump right into the components used for the test system instead. First up is the motherboard, and here I just used what I had on hand, which was the Gigawhite 70 LMT S2. It's an incredibly basic board, and as such we only have access to a 3 plus 1 phase VRM. Yikes. Let's just say there's a good reason why this board is limited to 95 watt CPUs. We also have a Radeon HD 3000 iGPU on board, which was a good 4-5 to five years out of date when this motherboard was made, but it makes for a convenient display adapter, I guess. Our memory is the tried and true 16GB kit of ADATA DDR3. It runs at 1600MHz with a CAS latency of 11, but I found that they're good for 2400MHz with a CAS latency of 10 with the right tuning. Not bad for a budget kit of RAM. For today's testing though, I just stuck with the stock settings to represent a more out of the box experience. For graphics, I opted to use my PowerColor Red Devil RX 5700 XT as it's the fastest GPU I currently own. It's hard to believe this card is 4 years old, but it's still as potent as ever and will definitely push the CPU to its limits. Moving on to the PSU, I brought out the big guns, an EVGA Supernova 1600G2 gold rated power supply. It's absolutely overkill for the system, but still, good to know that power delivery won't be an issue with this thirsty CPU and GPU. For cooling this toasty CPU, I used a fairly decent AMD stock cooler which has 4 copper heat pipes. I think it comes from a Phenom 2 originally. It's nothing crazy but did an excellent job at cooling the FX. Storage wise, I selected a Team Group AX2 512GB SSD for the boot drive, and all the games were loaded from a Toshiba 1TB laptop HDD, which definitely isn't my preference drive but I didn't have anything else lying around. The entire system will be housed in my usual testbed case, which is some generic mining rig frame that I picked up for under $20. It's a bit bare bones, but is a decent option if you need an open air case on the cheap. The resulting system looks a little bit silly as the 5700XT is almost as large as the entire motherboard, but just bear with me here. With the system covered, let's get on to the testing methodology. Now we're going to be testing 7 games here with the most release dates ranging from 2018 to 2021, so this suite should provide a pretty well rounded overview on how the CPU performs. I used OCAT to capture FPS as well as frame times, and this time around I opted not to include power draw figures as I'm still working on the proper methodology for that, but it's something I plan to touch on in a later revisit. Rather than using the lowest quality preset in each game, I opted to go for some more realistic settings for our GPU. I mean, after all, we are using a 5700 XT at 1080p, so on more capable platforms, we're going to be using the highest settings available in most cases. Now, if you're worried that this created a more GPU-bound scenario, let me assure you that despite using these settings, GPU usage hardly ever hit 100% in any of the games tested, so it was still all up to the FX to deliver on performance. As I show results for each game, I'll be playing back a capture of one of my runs so you can have a more detailed look at what CPU and GPU usage was like. On a separate note, I will say this chip could certainly benefit from a little tuning, but with this board's 3 plus 1 phase VRM, I'm afraid I just couldn't coax much out of the CPU, so I decided to include just stock results for today's testing. When I get my hands on a proper motherboard, I will revisit overclocking, but sadly it's just not very doable on this weak platform. With all that being said, here's a quick rundown of all the components used as well as the OS and drivers, and without any further ado, let's now dig into some testing. First game up is Cyberpunk 2077. Now here I used the Ultra preset with AMD FSR set at quality, and I used a 60 second run of the built in benchmark to get my numbers. The FX put down 49 frames per second on average, with 1% lows down to 30. Looking at the frame times, they look pretty good, with a fairly smooth experience in the first half of the benchmark, but you'll notice things definitely got a little shaky towards the end. This is because in the brief city section, GPU usage as well as frame rates fall off quite a lot as the CPU struggles to keep up, resulting in those inconsistent frame times seen in the latter half of the capture. 
Despite this though, it's a decent showing for the FX, and even in those demanding city scenes, it would be good for more than 30 FPS. Next game up is Hitman 3. I selected a mix of high and ultra settings with the simulation quality set to base as that the best setting it's a complete slideshow. Anyhow I used the Dartmoor benchmark for testing and we achieved 79 frames per second on average with 1% lows down to 35. Now frame times are a tad inconsistent as we see some hiccups throughout the entire run along with a couple scenes in the middle of the benchmark that gave our CPU a run for its money. Even so, overall the FX holds up pretty well to this game and the averages well above 60 FPS are very much welcome. Now the next game was a huge surprise for me, Red Dead Redemption 2. Here we're using the Ultra preset along with the Vulcan API and captured our numbers from a 130 second run of the built in benchmark. The FX managed 53 frames per second on average with 1% lows down to 33. Frame times were actually pretty good if a little micro stuttery, but it never got too unpleasant. Even though our CPU is almost completely pegged in this game, the 5700 XT sees close to 100% utilization a lot of the time, which is extremely impressive. Great to see that we're maxing out all 6 threads here while adequately feeding that powerful card, it's not something you'll see too often when testing this mismatched CPU and GPU combo. 2019's Metro Exodus is the next game we tested, and I settled for the Ultra preset with Nvidia Hairworks and Advanced PhysX disabled. Since the built-in benchmark is not very representative of in-game performance, I measured a quick 60 second run just walking through the swamp as it put plenty of strain on the system. The chip put down 54 frames per second, with 1% lows down to 29. As for the frame times, they were good enough here, but there was a pretty huge spike over 150 milliseconds in the middle of the run, which was repeatable every single time. This was just one major spike though, and the CPU delivers fairly consistent frame times in the rest of the benchmark. Looking at GPU usage though, you can tell the 5700 XT is just begging for a faster CPU here, as it would hardly go above 50% utilization. Pretty stark contrast compared to Red Dead 2. Next up we have Monster in Our World, and I use the highest preset along with the Fateful Encounters cutscene for testing as it's consistent and demanding, and I found it to be fairly representative of in-game performance as well. We averaged 83 frames per second, with 1% lows down to 60. Now this is what frame times should look like. Throughout the whole run we only see a couple of very minor swings which resulted in a buttery smooth experience. Truth be told, I don't think the CPU was under a whole lot of stress here, but even then GPU usage wasn't getting all that close to 100%. It's an interesting result for sure. Second to last game is GTA 5. We used the very high settings throughout along with 8xAA and used the last scene of the built-in benchmark to get these numbers. The FX achieved 58 frames per second on average, with 1% lows down to 35. Frame times look a little bit rocky throughout the whole run, and you'll notice the driving section of the benchmark is a bit slower than the first half as again CPU usage rises with GPU usage promptly decreasing as the FX struggles. The game still performs decently there however, as despite the demanding scenes we are well above 30 FPS during most of that driving section. Rounding off the testing we have Project Cars 3. Using the ultra settings and a quick hot lap we averaged 63 frames per second with 1% lows down to 41. Frame times were good and it was a very smooth experience with not much stutter during the benchmark. Surprisingly this game can be quite CPU intensive as it put a lot of strain on the FX in this short run. Some segments even see both our CPU and GPU at high utilization which is again great to see, wasn't expecting the FX to keep up with the 5700 XT here. Overall it's another good showing for the FX 6300. I will say it's crazy to see that this underdog is still a fairly competent performer in this modern suite of games. It's funny because upon its release, Piledriver had a pretty lukewarm reception, with a lot of criticism levied against the poor single core performance compared to Intel's Ivy Bridge. However, I do think AMD's trade for multi-thread performance has helped these CPUs in the long run, especially as games start to make use of more and more cores. To be honest, with the FX6300 I was fully expecting it to do a terrible job feeding this 5700 XT, but I gotta say, Red Dead Redemption 2 and Project Cars 3 are making me eat some crow. Really didn't see that coming. I'd imagine some overclocking would definitely help GPU usage in some of the less performant games, but with the current setup I just can't do much there unfortunately.
Either way, despite recently turning 10 years old, the FX6300 is still a capable chip for modern games. It's genuinely surprising, especially considering the bad reputation AMD FX is usually associated with. While I'm not hailing this as the new budget meta for CPUs or anything, I think they're definitely worth checking out in newer games as they can be more potent than you might think. I'm not done with the CPU yet as I'm hoping to obtain a more capable motherboard for overclocking, so if any of you have suggestions on some decent and preferably cheaper 990FX or 970 motherboards, I'd love to hear them in the comments below. For now though, that'll be it for this episode. Thanks for sticking around to the end, and I'll see you in the next one.